Well, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. And as we celebrate the most powerful event in human history, as we gather together throughout literally the world in celebration of this event that we call Easter, which is the, again, most powerful event in the history of humanity, all of time literally is measured by the cross. We measure time by B.C. before Christ and A.D. after his death. That's how powerful the life and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus actually was. And more than just an event throughout human history, and we're definitely acknowledging that event today, how many of you know we're actually celebrating a person, a person Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. So when we talk about resurrection weekend, we're not just talking about a physical date or moment in history, though it was the most powerful, again, moment in human history. We're talking about a person that is alive. We're talking about a person that is here today, and the same power that raised him from the dead has raised you and I from our death of sins and trespasses. And if you don't know him, there's power to change your life. There's power to change your eternity. There's power to change literally your being. And it's a person, the resurrection, Jesus Christ. And that's who we're celebrating. Maybe, maybe you're here today and, or watching and you're not sure what all the excitement is about. Well, it's about Jesus. Hallelujah. And it's about what he's really done in our lives and this engaging that he is having with us as we walk through this life. Everything we celebrate is truly about Jesus today, but is connected to us. The reason I'm excited is not just because of something that happened 2,000 years ago. That's important. It's powerful, but I'm excited that he is alive and he is with us today forever hugging on us, hallelujah, and loving on us as we respond by faith. So maybe you're not, you're not there, but God wants to get you there. Maybe somebody drugged you here today. And that's okay. Maybe you're here because you're drugged. That's okay. <laughs> we don't care why you're here or how you got here. And neither does God. Because you're going to have an encounter with a true and a living God. And that's why we're excited. It's not looking back. It's living in us, the resurrection, Jesus Christ. Well, we see this from Matthew's account. And I want to share some things from Matthew's account of the death of Jesus, and we'll just have to, to highlight this, but in Matthew 27, look with me at verse 50, Jesus is about to die on the cross, and Jesus was after something when he came to this world. Jesus had a mission when he came to this world, and he fulfilled that mission, and it's culminated, him coming and being among us here at the cross. And we'll jump in in verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth, now think about this, the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves, thank you, Jesus, that's a mystery. These dead people are coming out of graves after his resurrection, and they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Four quick things happened at the death of and resurrection of Jesus, we see here that the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. That's exciting to me. That says that man didn't rent that veil. Man didn't make a way. Religion can't make a way for you to have a relationship with God, for you to encounter the true and the living God. But an angel 
from the top of that veil in that temple that separated God's Shekinah glory from his people, an angel ripped that thing from the top to the bottom, signifying the way to God has been made available now. All of us can know God now. Nothing can separate you from God but you. Nothing can keep you from eternity with God but you. No one is standing right now between you and God. We have total access because of who Jesus is, the resurrection, and what he's done, we have total access into the presence of God. And even if you don't know him today, the way has been made, and the way was not made by man. The way was made by the Son of God and a relationship with him now, and you can have that freely by faith. Hallelujah. That's good news. That's good news. Maybe you're watching or maybe you're here and you've got these thoughts of, well, if them hypocrites down at the church make it, I'll make it. That's not good theology. What if the hypocrites don't make it? Amen. <laughs> but if there's a hypocrite standing between you and God, the hypocrite's closer to God than you are. Don't let a hypocrite, don't let the failures of the church, don't let Christians that may not be Christians at all keep you from the presence of God, keep you from an eternity with a loving, caring God keep you from God's divine purpose for your life because I'm here to tell you God wills nothing but good for you and your family and Jesus has made a way hallelujah rip that thing from the top to the bottom then it says the earthquake there wasn't just an earthquake the entire earth quaked at the death of Jesus this thing we talk about, this thing we celebrate, this person that we've come to know personally, when he died, it wasn't an isolated event. The entire earth quaked. If you were standing on one side of the earth, you would have thought it was just an earthquake. But at the same time, on the other side of the world, if you were standing there, you'd have thought it was an earthquake. But it wasn't an earthquake. The entire earth quaked. What Jesus did for us was for the whole world, hallelujah. It's not just for a select elect. It's not just for a chosen frozen. It's not just for a few. God so loved the world. When Jesus died, the entire planet was shook at the death of this man. The rocks split because Jesus came to save us first the apex of God's creation. God came to bring us back, to buy us back into relationship with him. But our salvation doesn't even stop with us. It starts with us, but the entire planet is being redeemed by this man called Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Eventually, he's going to return, and the curse of the fall, and the entire planet that's groaning now, waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God, will be saved. Man, you're not going to save this planet, and you can't destroy this planet. Who do we think we are? God has saved us, and God will even save the planet at the return of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I love how it says then that the graves were open. There was so much power that was released from on high to raise Jesus from the, from the dead. So much life penetrated even Abraham's bosom. And those that had fallen asleep that were waiting on the Messiah, many of them came out of their graves. Jesus whoo, raised from the dead. And there was this, there was this vacuum, hallelujah. There was this, this wave of light and life that people were just standing in Abraham's bosom that he had just talked to, and they fill a pool, a gravitational pull up instead of down, hallelujah. And they went into the city saying, he's alive, Jesus is alive. Can you imagine having dinner and Uncle Joe shows up that died 10 years ago? I mean, and some of you, I'm not being mean, I know it's Easter, we need to be nice, but... So, some of you aren't really disappointed that Uncle Joe died. <laughs> and Uncle Joe comes crashing through the doors. I'm alive because he's alive. And what's for dinner? Hallelujah. <laughs> that would have been so much fun. I've had so many wonderful things happen to me in my adventure with Jesus. But man, I would have loved to have been there. And somebody that had died 10 years shows up at the front door, hallelujah. Jesus is powerful. The resurrection is powerful. 
There's a power. Let me just speak to those of you, of you who know him. There's a power coming again at his return that is going to shake everything. Hallelujah. It's going to shake us up. And it's going to be a glorious shakening. Now, let me go into now five quick things that are clear in Scripture of why Jesus came. There are people watching. There are people, again, in other churches even, that really don't know why Jesus came, who he really is, and the mission he was on. And I'm just going to cover quickly five clear things that the Scripture specifically says, this is why he came. Some scriptures are clear, and, and honestly, you have to have help to misunderstand them. Now, don't misunderstand me. Some of us have had a lot of help in misunderstanding the Bible, but there's certain things that are just clear. Other things, a little challenging. You, you, you have to pray. You have to, to think about, and on and on it could go, but a lot of things are just clear, like don't commit adultery. Can I get a witness? That's pretty clear. Well, what do you think he meant? Don't commit adultery. Well, what are the nuances? There are no nuances. It's not opaque. Don't commit adultery. These scriptures are like that. Let me go through these quickly. Number one, why did Jesus come? He came to do God's will. He came to do God's will, not your will, not my will, not his own will. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7 says, uh, be beloved. Uh, or behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Jesus didn't come and do his own thing. He came to fulfill the will of God. He didn't do anything except he saw the Father do it, and he didn't say anything except he heard the Father say it. Number two, he came to destroy the works of the devil, the works of Satan. 1 John 3, 8, it starts off with, with how that he that sins is of the devil, for the devil sinned uh, and has sinned since the beginning. But then it says, and for this purpose or this cause was the Son of Man, the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to whip the snot out of the devil. <laughs> Jesus came to bruise his head. Jesus came... And had a mission, and it wasn't to destroy us, it was to destroy the works of the devil. In Revelation chapter 1, verse uh, uh, somewhere in Revelation chapter 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. And then, and, and then he said, and I am he that is alive, that was dead, but I am alive, and I got the keys now of hell, death, and the grave. He defeated Satan and Satan's works over humanity. And that includes me and that includes you. So we don't need to be confused. Why did Jesus come? To destroy the works of the devil. Number three, to take away our sins. To take away our sins. 1 John 3, 5. And you know. I love those kind of scriptures. And you know. I hope we know. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins. And in him there is no sins. So why did Jesus come? He didn't come to condemn us for our sins, nor did he come to condone our sins. He came to take them away. Isn't that good news? That he came to take them away. Number four, he came to reveal God's true nature. He came to show us God. Moses came and God sent Moses to reveal sin, Romans 3.20. But Jesus came to show us God. He came to reveal the nature of God, the goodness of God, the mercies and tender mercies of God that are fresh and new every morning. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came to show us God. Colossians 1.15 says he's the visible image of an invisible God. Colossians 2.9 says that it pleased God that in him, Jesus, should the fullness of the Godhead bod dwell bodily. Jesus is God's selfie. <laughs> if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. 
God is invisible. He's a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But God, before the iPhone was invented, already had one and went... (laughs) And Jesus is the picture of God, a perfect picture of God. I was ministering in England years ago, and a lady came up to us at the table and, and said... I really love this Jesus you're talking about. I just have a problem with God, the Father. And in her mind, God, the Father, was mean and wrathful and and full of vengeance and, and wanted to punish everybody and curse everybody. She had this distorted picture of God, the Father, and thought Jesus was a side of God, like the good side of God, like the other side of God, like Wives are ribs of men. The first woman came out of the first man was a rib. And if you look it up in the Hebrew, it's other side. Our wives are the other side of us. They're the polite side. (laughs) They're the merciful side. Don't look at me like that. (laughs) Jesus is not the other side of God, the hidden side of God. No, Jesus is God made flesh and dwelt among us. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. If you know Jesus, you know the Father. And there's still to this day much confusion. Many of you are watching, others may be here, and you've got a distorted picture of God. You've got this Old Testament picture of God under the law, and the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus came to show us the true nature of God And that leads me to number five, and this is what I want to end my time with during the service. Number five reason Jesus came in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it's very clear. He says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Why did Jesus came? Why did Jesus came? (laughs) Wait till God calls you to preach. (laughs) Why did Jesus come? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come to destroy us. He didn't come to condemn us. He didn't come to, to hurt us or harm us. He didn't come to take our children away from us because of our sins that many of us have been taught and heard. He didn't come to make us sick. He came, he sought us out. He came to seek and to save that which, which was lost. It saddens me to this day how many people have a distorted picture of why Jesus came and his heart to save us. Even, even many people, I don't, I'm not being critical, I'm trying to make a point, but, but they'll talk about how they found God. God wasn't lost. God found us. And God saved us, and God changed us, and God revealed his goodness to us and his love and patience and mercy to us. And no chapter embodies God seeking us and saving us. Like Luke chapter 15, would you go there quickly? Luke chapter 15, this is the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And obviously, I'm only going to be able to highlight this and want to encourage you that know the Lord for sure to go back over this to to revive and refresh your salvation and how God sought you. Those of us that are celebrating, we're only celebrating because we know God found us and that God saved us. And in this parable, we're reminded how there was the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, and two of the three did not have a choice. The master just sought them and recovered them. The owner sought them and recovered them. But the third parable illustration of God's great love for us and why Jesus came was was the prodigal son, the prodigal son, the lost son. 
Let me just say something quickly here. It's controversial. I'm not trying to be controversial. So I'll be as, as, as kind as possible. But there are people in the world that talk about how everybody and everyone is a child of God. And I know what they mean by that, and they are wrong. However, all of us did come from God. All of us were created by God in our mother's womb, and there's a point of accountability in which we are lost. We're still from God, but Jesus talked about people that were of their father, the devil, and on and on I could go. No, we are the children of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me just say this, you can't lose something you don't have. You can't lose something you don't have. We belong to God. Every one of us are his inheritance, but we are lost without Jesus Christ. We are dead in our sins and trespasses without Jesus Christ. We are not good independent of Jesus Christ. We are lost, but God is pursuing the lost. God is seeking the lost. God loves the lost and God will not give up on you and the hounds of hell will pursue you or the hounds of heaven all the way to the gates of hell because of God's great love for you. The prodigal son teaches us the power of choice and that God loves everybody. And so much confusion even in the church. Well, God loves everybody. Of course God loves everybody. The issue isn't, does God love you? The issue is, do you love him back? Without him, we're lost. We belong to him. He has paid for us. He created us all in our mother's womb, but we have a choice. And we must make the right choice on loving God back. Hell is full, unfortunately. Hell, a place that Jesus said wasn't created for people. Hell, a place that was created for the devil and his angels, is full of people that God loved. The only difference between you and I and the lost is one day we said, I do to Jesus. He was pursuing us with a passion and a love and a desire to save us from our fallen condition, to save us from what Satan had done to us, to take away our sins, to destroy the works of the devil, to bring us back to our heavenly father. But we have to choose. And that's what these stories unveil. Look at the first First few, first few verses, um, verse one. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. I like the King James Bible. It says the publicans, the publicans. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners. That's how religious people say it, like a snake. Sinners. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> this man receives sinners and eats with them. Took me a long time to really figure that out. Where are they coming from? What's the big deal? But eating to the Hebrews was a mini covenant, a mini covenant. And to them, he was, he was condoning their sin. And how many of you know, again, Jesus didn't come to condemn us in our sin, nor condone our sin, but he loved us in our sin. So he spoke this parable unto them. Again, their attitude is something we have to guard our hearts against as the people of God. We can never forget the condition we were in when God found us. Honestly, saints, hear my heart. Listen, God is separating us in this hour. He's, he's sanctifying us and setting us apart, but not to be self-righteous, not to be condescending to people that are in the same condition we were in before we were found. Again, it, it literally says in the King James Bible that he eats with sinners and republicans. Most horrible thing you can do. And Jesus is countering this bad attitude. 
of forgetting where we've all come from, of forgetting that no matter how lost a lost person is that you come across, that was you before Jesus. And so he tells the three, the three illustrations. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? This one sheep is of high value to the shepherd. He's not neglecting the 99. He just values the lost. And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise... There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. He's not saying God doesn't care about us that are a part of his flock. He's not saying God neglects us. He's saying he sent his son to save the whole world. And we can never lose the heart of the father that there is joy in heaven over one person making a commitment to Jesus Christ, hallelujah. Then he talks about this woman that loses a coin and she has 10 silver coins. If she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, what does she do? She calls friends together saying, rejoice with me. I have found the peace which I have lost. Something of value. Something she's not willing to let go of. Just because she has nine, she doesn't count the nine and go nine, one, ah. Shepherd goes, I got 99 attending, one, ah. No, we go after the one. We go after the coin. Why? Value. It is of value. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's not only joy in heaven every time the lost is found. This says there's joy in the presence of the angels. That's God. God cuts a rug when anyone comes to Jesus, hallelujah. <laughs> Why don't we cut a rug? Why don't we rejoice? Why don't we realize why he came and that we're participants in that? Then the next one is the real mystery for us. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them, not just to the son that asked for his inheritance. He gave the inheritance to both, both boys uh, and divided them his livelihood. This is a mystery to me. This is just... I mean, a lot of times we don't put ourselves in the place of the scriptures. We don't, we don't realize this is real. Picture it in your mind. Like if one of my children came to me and said, Dad, you're stronger than a horse. You're going to outlive every single one of us. Can I have my inheritance now? What inheritance? You owe me $500,000 for food, <laughs> room, and board. It's like, and if you don't change your mind fast, the other three are going to get a greater inheritance. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> the father gives him his inheritance. You know the story, he squanders it with fair weather friends, harlots. He comes to the end of himself. He's, he's working on a pig farm. This is a kosher Jew here. He's even wanting to eat the pig food. You can't go any lower in a Jew's mind. They won't even eat the pig, much less the food the pigs eat. This is bad. It doesn't get any worse. He comes to himself. Man, my father's hired servants live better than this. I'm going to repent. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going home. And you know the story. The father was looking for him. See, in the first two parables, God went after them. But they didn't have a choice. Sheep and coins. In the third parable, 
the father is waiting and looking. It says he saw him afar off. See, the Holy Spirit is chasing everybody in the earth right now. And the father is waiting and looking for you to turn your heart to him, for you to come home, for you to come back to God's original plan for you that Satan has stolen from the masses. And he runs after him when he sees him. I love that. Holy Spirit went and got him. And now the father is looking for him and comes running, and kisses him. Man, I love that picture. Puts a robe on his back, makes him righteous, robe of righteousness. Puts a ring on his finger, marriage, family, covenant. Puts new shoes on his feet that you're going to walk in newness of life and all your inheritance that I'm excited to get back to you now. And then throws a party. Throws a party. And the older boy is upset about it. Go to verse 32, the end of it. The older boy represented the Pharisees at the beginning of this parable who had a bad attitude about the lost and doesn't want to party, doesn't want to rejoice. But look at what the father says in the last verse, verse 32. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost but is found. How many of you know we have an older brother in the kingdom of God and he's not outside the party begrudging our repentance. Jesus is our older brother that's dancing in heaven every time we come home. Every time we come home. I've lost things throughout my life. Traveling a lot, just traveling all the time. I lost a pair of shoes one time. And I thought about it for a couple of minutes. But it's just a pair of shoes. It didn't have high value to me. I lost my keys one time. That was a different story. <laughs> I sought them things out all day long. And at the end of the day, I even prayed and asked God to help me. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. That's usually how we do it. Let's, as a last resort, pray. I sought for those keys. I was passionate about it. And when I found them... I rejoiced, and I expected everybody else to rejoice. But a pair of shoes is one thing, a set of keys is another thing, but what about a child? I've only told this story one time. This is the last time, and I'm going to do my best to tell all of it. Because the first time I told it, it's so embarrassing, I didn't get it all told. And so I'm going to try one more time, but this is it. Sue and I had four kids, have four kids. <laughs> she actually had them. But we together have four children and they were real little and Angelica was the youngest. And she was just a daddy's girl and we were out shopping in a mall and Sue took the other three kids back to the car and I had one more shop I wanted to look in. And Jelly, we call her affectionately Jelly, she, she stayed with me. And we went into this store and the counter was glass. And the sides were glass. And so she's three years old and so she can see through the glass. So she is excited about what she's getting to see and, and she let go of my leg. She, she used to always hang on to my leg. It's not my fault that she let go of my leg. <laughs> and so I'm shopping and just thinking, and I have this bad habit of meditating all the time practically, and, and, and Sue calls it Dwayne's world. <laughs> and so I had just entered into Dwayne's world, and I'm just loving on the Lord and thinking about the Lord. And so I left the store and was cutting across the parking lot thanking Jesus. I was being spiritual. And so I'm, I'm headed for the car and Sue sees me coming across the parking lot 
and Jelly's not with me. And so she jumps out of the car, comes running toward me like somebody had assaulted her. I wanted to know who the man was that had done this to her. <laughs> and she said, where is Jelly? Or where is Angelica? I was the man. <laughs> and lightning struck my brain and... And as I often do, even in warped sarcasm, I came back real quick and said, she's right where I left her. And I took off running. I mean, my heart was pounding. And my passion to find her was priceless. Are you listening to me? Everything was on the line. My life, my marriage, everything. <laughs> was on the line. And I ran as fast as I could through that mall. I got back to that place that I think she let go of my leg. And there was this huge, big black man standing there. And he was smiling. And he looked at me and he said, I knew you'd come back. <laughs> He's just watching over Angelica going through the store. I believe I have entertained angels unaware. Hallelujah. Saints, I'm not going to cry. In the name of Jesus, I'm not going to cry. But I cannot articulate the joy. Amen. And seeing her running to me, jumping into my arms. Not only did I have an unprecedented passion to find her, when I found her, it was joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let me tell you, God is passionately pursuing you if you don't know him. And I guarantee you, you turn your heart to him for a second. and He will just receive you into his arms. And it'll be joy unspeakable and full of glory, not only in heaven, but in this place today. Amen.